HMS by Jove was conceived in the late 1800s at a time when the Royal Navy's Design Bureau's traditional rum ration was being experimentally laced with the products of the Opium War. And it showed. After several months partaking of increasingly strong doses of their new rations, the self-styled Grand Admiral Milligan had an idea. This idea was built to counter the new American ship USS Second Amendment Rights and the new Japanese ship Most Honourable Combat. The ship's launch and naming was notable, as due to a calendar mix-up, Queen Victoria was met by an honour guard of Royal Marines in, um, shall we say, a slightly underdressed condition. Apparently, the calendar in the Marine barracks had stated it was dressed down Friday, and the Royal Marines in question had followed their tradition of taking everything to the most excessive degree, and truly dressed down. The commissioning ceremony therefore passed off vaguely successfully, although the name was as a result of the Marine Troop Band coming round the ship's prow just as Queen Victoria was about to swing the celebratory bottle, resulting in the exclamation, Oh, by Jove! as the bottle crashed into the ship's prow, hence the name. The ship was built at a time when sail power was finally being completely replaced with coal-fired engines, and in many ways she could be said to have perfectly straddled that line. As the masts and sails were positioned directly behind the funnels, they would regularly catch fire, which meant that the ship would start the voyage with a full set of masts and sails, and end the voyage in the much more technologically advanced state of no masts or sails. The Royal Navy was under strict instructions to not include any more silly gun pits for muzzle-loading guns, but the design crew had decided that the, muzzle, that the gun pits were the only things that needed to go, and the guns were muzzle-loaded from a zero degrees position, which meant that the, main, that the shells had to be carried out onto the main deck on little trolleys, which then had to be jacked up into the air, and at an altitude of about eight foot up, somebody with a very, very short life expectation had to whack the shells repeatedly on the nose with a stick to try and coax them into the barrel of the gun, whereupon they could be rammed down, or, as practice would generally show, the guns could simply be elevated to maximum elevation, which would allow the shells to slide neatly into place. In a precursor to HMS Dreadnought, it was determined that having the fire control immediately behind one of the funnels would be a fantastic way of hiding the fire control position from the enemy, thus deceiving them into thinking that there was no fire control. Even after this decision proved to be somewhat detrimental to the ship's gunnery and the life expectancy of the officers and men stationed within, it was retained as the Admiral decided that this was the perfect location to hang his kippers and smoke them for ready for his breakfast every morning. Largely on account of all records of the ship's construction being quietly burned out of shame, the ship survived Admiral Fisher's cuts as he had no idea the ship actually existed, and so it found itself bewilderingly placed into frontline duty in World War I. The tendency of the masts and rigging to catch fire was therefore found to have an unexpected benefit, as it provided a massive smokescreen for the ship, at all times, which rather concealed it from the enemy, the Germans having great difficulty hitting what appeared to be a mobile fog bank. Due to the fine nature of the kippers produced, the ship was hastily refitted with turbines and inducted as flagship of the battlecruiser fleet. Once again, her unusual design process proved to be surprisingly beneficial, as when Flag Officer Seymour attempted to hoist Beatty's orders, the flags were immediately set on fire by the exhaust from the ship's funnels, and therefore nobody paid attention to them. As a result, British battlecruiser efficiency increased markedly. However, as German battlecruiser technology advanced, even the refitted turbine engines proved insufficient to allow the ship to keep up with the latest and greatest in the high seas fleet. Seeing as how all records of the ship had been destroyed, the original design team were the only ones who knew anything about the ship, and so they were hauled out of the asylums they'd been committed to several years earlier, and asked to retrofit the ship for greater speed. On seeing a Royal Flying Corps aircraft passing overhead, they concluded that aero engines would be the perfect solution. 
On paper, this seemed like a good idea since aero engines were lightweight, highly fuel efficient, compared to every other form of propulsive technology and could be manufactured in mass numbers. Unfortunately, this being the design team that had come up with the ship in the first place, their solution eventually ended up trying to attach several aero engines whilst still in their aircraft to the ship to tow it along to greater speeds, with um, questionable results. After the loss of several pilots, the Royal Navy resorted to the highly unusual practice of sorcery, in a dark and forbidden ceremony aboard the deck of HMS Victory, the admirals of the fleet condemned both the design team and the idea of using aero engines as the propulsive power plant for Royal Navy warships to the deepest, darkest circles of the netherworld that they could possibly imagine. By their powers combined, the first, second and third sea lords condemned this idea to not see the light of day for at least another hundred years. The ship was finally scrapped immediately after World War I, whereupon the nation breathed a huge sigh of relief, and Great Britain as a nation resolved never again to do anything quite so idiotic, ridiculous, or self-defeating. Although since the Admiralty had left the ritual running, this too was condemned and locked away for a hundred years. Whilst naval historians have been somewhat scathing about the ship, they all do concede that it was still at least somewhat superior to some of the early French pre-dreadnoughts. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.